Hello and welcome to Dinesh Guarda Cities ABC Open Business Council YouTube podcast series. We are very excited about uh, this series and about profiling some of the leading personalities, creators, artists, and people making our world a better and more special place. And we've been actually privileged to be portraying and as well speaking with some of the leading personalities in the world. But what we like about this series is the passion that we put about this and as well the uniqueness of everyone that we've been actually portraying and talking to. We've been having scientists, robots, artists, filmmakers, and all kinds of different personalities, but all to share a common thing. All of them share a passion to make things, to make things forward, and as well to make the world a better space and a better and more privileged to show their dreams and to show their uh, achievements, but as well to make things that are not easy to do, that take a lot of courage, a lot of persistence, and most of people only see the final end game, not the process that is, that is going through. And that's what we do in this series that right now are reaching a global audience that we have been growing in the last one year. Actually, we are making one year since we started and we're very excited to continue pushing forward this. So today I have uh, with us uh, someone that is, I would say is difficult to put in the box, but that has a fantastic career and is uh, someone that I deeply admire because it uh, managed to touch a lot of special areas that are really unique in everything. So I welcome Amrita Sen, and I will just highlight some of her profile and bio because it's really, we could talk for a long time, but I'm really, I wanna to touch some of the achievements that Amrita Sen uh, achieved, but as well the differences of things and how she manages things completely diametrable opposite, but actually making them all work together and as well creating a global profile that is unique in its areas, but as well in achievements. So Amrita Sen is a US-based successful designer, singer, producer, and businesswoman of Indian-themed products and entertainment for global markets. Amrita Sen combines the creation of original artistic content with extensive business experiences that commercializes unique products of retail and on hair. What is interesting about Amrita is that she touches music, design, film and TV, and she has been working and collaborating with some of the leading artists and creators in the planet. So on the music, Amrita has been a prominent Bollywood playback singer and musician for the last 10 years. And in 2009, Amrita performed at the Academy Awards with music legend A.R. Rahman singing J. Hal from the Oscar winning movie Slumdog Millionaire. And uh, Amrita has performed and recorded with several major recording artists and music groups that include Justin Timberlake, Wizard, Timbaland, Pitbull, A.R. Rahman, and the LA Philharmonic. Most recently, Amrita scored and performed in Leonardo DiCaprio HBO climate change documentary, Ice on Fire. And she's been working consumer products in a lot of different areas. So on design, Amrita has created the Amrita Sand Designs that is a very successful design platform that creates original Indian themed art on successful lines of fashion and home products. With currently or every tale at Wayfair, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, Beth Bath and Behind, and Shop NBC, just to say a few. Amrita has also created collections with MAC, Cosmetics, and their illustra illustrated book, Cosmic and Eternal Love, Chronicle Books, was prominently featured at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and Walmart. And last but not least, in her film and TV career, she's been uh, producing and uh, both Indian adaptation, and probably one of the most famous ones, John Le Carré, the night manager. She's starring in A-list actor Istrik Rosnan and for, the, for Disney Plus Odd Star. In addition to ZTS, Amrita has a production slate deal with the Roth Kirkenbaum films, which include projects 
with the WWE, John Cena, Tiger Shroff, among other high-profile Hollywood, Bollywood films slated for release in 2022. So that's quite a, an amazing. And I want to just to finish as well, because I think it's particularly interesting. She was as well um, a, a CEO of Vault. Uh, there was a, 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 an organization that has worked with Capital Records at the start of her career and Goldman Sachs. And as well, to finish, of course, in terms of education, she has a BS from the Wharton School of University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from Harvard Business School, which is already an achievement in itself. So welcome to our series, uh, Amrit. I'm very excited to have you here and to share these moments and time with you. Thanks so much, Dennis, for having me and having read my bio back to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I have to read it because I think for people listening to us, it's really impressive, uh, all the different things and how we, you combine all of this. So I would like to start, uh, my first question is really, I always like to go to, to the foundations. Um, and the foundations, of course, in your case is from uh, India to US, but as well about your education, besides, of course, the US uh, education, which, of course, touches some of the top organizations of education in the world. But how did you start in a bit of your family background? Because I think it's important. I always like, especially for my children and for other, is I think for me, what may, marked me in my education was the story of people like you and other people and the, how they achieve what they achieve. And I think this is the, the construction that is important for education, but as well to create narratives for everyone listening to us. So I would like to start with your, the beginning of your narrative, beginning of your story. Um, my origin story is very much defined by being an Indian immigrant from India growing up in the 1980s America, right? 1980s America in New Jersey is a very different, was a very different place than it is today. It was not ethnically diverse. They didn't know who Indian people were and they often didn't uh, think Indian people were favorable to them. <laughs> so that was a very different time in America. It was just um, maybe, you know, 10 years after the uh, civil rights movement had started. What New Jersey, to, is today and what America is today for in, for immigrants is a is a great place. I think it's a great heartwarming place where people are very open to new cultures. I don't think that it was that case in the eighties, um, but that also becomes part of your journey. Um, my feeling towards being an immigrant in this amazing country is that as you grow older, as you become uh, a professional living and working in America, you have to figure out for yourself how much of that immigrant experience you're going to draw from. You could decide to draw 10% of your professional um, outlook from that immigrant experience, or you can draw from it 100%, right? So 100% of your immigrant experience could be used towards your professional career. In my case, right? I ended up using quite about 50%, right? I think it's a little bit higher than most people. Like my husband, I think, uses uh, 20%. In my case, I used, uh, you know, half of my professional career draws from my experience as a child here living and breathing in America. And what I mean by that is to stay connected to India, my parents very much leaned in on Indian art and design, Indian art and specifically Indian drawings. And uniquely, I had a very, very high propensity towards singing and drawing when I was a kid. I was really good. I was a really good singer. I'm a good singer now, but I was particularly good as a kid and I was particularly good at drawing. So that largely shaped my experience of becoming a distinctly unique person as a child. And I really became something that is uh, something that was hard to explain even back then. Um, but being an Indian artist and singer growing up in immigrant America is not really the best way of commercializing yourself or making a living. So it was in fact the education, it was in fact going to Wharton and then having true business experience 
not, not to mention just going back to business school, but having real work experience that says, okay, this works, this doesn't, this could be commercialized, this allows you to make a living, this doesn't allow you to make a living. Um, that really became the critical part of me, me being able to draw from who I was. So, uh, but in essence, you know, you kind of learn later on in life that I am a, an American, right? I love America. I am an American business person, but I'm distinctly gifted with some unique Indian oriented artistic skills. So then the question is, well, how do you make that work? And how do you, how do you make a living? That is really, I, I want to touch that because there's a lot of things over there. There's the background, the culture, which like you mentioned, um, now we have this, we still have a lot of challenges, but of course in the eighties, I'm sure that it was much different than it is now, because now at least as a conscious of cosmopolitan, even if there's a lot of issues, but people forget how far we have come. But at the same time, from the culture, there's the culture and the creative parts that you start as an artist, and then you learn how to shift from being, or continue being an artist, but as well being, uh, creating a business out of that. And I want to touch that because that is very American. I think it's unique in America. For instance, as me, me as a Portuguese and French European, um, my culture was kind of being an entrepreneur was never seen, even if my parents were entrepreneurs, were never seen as kind of a, a very positive thing. Uh, and for instance, if I go to my French part of the family, it's probably even more strange. So um, how do you see that part of the part of you as a creative? Uh, because you are drawing, you are singing, and you are doing music. And as well, the part of you as uh, starting to become a business person, which was the beginning of your career as well. I think if I had a different upbringing where there was much more financial means, probably my path would have been to do 100% creative, right? To be a singer, to be, move into composition, to be um, a songwriter, and then to have a very robust, perhaps a robust um, visual arts career too. Maybe those thing, two things could have lived, lived side by side. The not having the financial resources early on really shaped me, right? Because it made it cl clear to me that I had to make money after I got my education or I had to make money, period. So getting an education, um, a college education in America is critical, I think. If you're not going to lead a completely creative and, you know, like become a rock star mm -hmm. or become, you know, a, a visual artist with an agent, with a gallery, I think a college education is probably the most impactful thing you can do in this country, maybe worldwide. But for me, it was um, the need to make money, the need to not live with my parents and to be independent that said, you know what, forget doing a purely creative job now, forget that, you have more immediate priorities. You know, you have to, you have to eat. So those things seem inconvenient at the time. Those things may even seem inconvenient for the first 15 years, but it's probably a good thing in the long run, right? To, to be able to learn how to make money like a traditional person in America is not a bad thing at all. It's fantastic. And I think as well, there's a sense of uh, meritocracy that is unique in the world, I would say. And I'm sure that uh, if you look as well, um, a lot of the successful, actually some of the most successful people in the US and in the world are actually Indian Americans, which is quite interesting from CEOs of leading top companies to uh, filmmakers, creators and so forth. But I, I would like to start, so from that education, and of course you choose two of the top uh, educational, academic educations in the world. How did you start your career? Because I would like to go through that. And I think especially, let's say an artist listening to you now, as much more tools to build a career than you on, on the eighties, because now you have the Instagrams, we have all social media, but it's not easy. And most of the education is not tailored towards that. So I'd like to see how did you build your fantastic career? And how did you start it? Well, you know, I started my career in investment banking. I was an analyst at Goldman Sachs. And then I um, had a choice to go to business school after Goldman Sachs or to do another job. I really wanted to uh, get another second work experience before going to business school. Goldman at that time had a fantastic client called Columbia HCA. They were the, world, they were the country's biggest hospital company. 
So I wanted to be distinctive in my business career. So I got fired from Goldman. <laughs> I think I got fired. Although my two year analyst uh, program is over, I wasn't offered a, an opportunity to stay at Goldman. And then, uh, and I get, we could get into all the reasons why, which is kind of interesting in itself. But I worked for a company called Columbia HCA. I started off in investor relations and then really had an eye towards working for the CEO. The CEO at the time was Rick Scott. He is t currently today a US Senator of Florida and uh, he used to be Florida's governor, but at the time he was my boss. So I worked for him for about three years and he probably was singularly the most influential business person in my career, showing me how to start things. You know, I, I ran special projects for a, a very big company with, you know, 20,000 employees at the time. And I had a big job working as a 24 year old working for the CEO of this nation's biggest healthcare company. Uh, I believe he, his recommendation alone got me into Harvard Business School, you know. Um, I don't think it was anything else. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I did a good job there. I worked 90 hours a week. And the reason I went back to business school is that I didn't want to stay in healthcare. I, I knew very early on, even in my Goldman days, that Goldman Sachs days, that I did not, I ultimately belonged in a business that had to do a lot with music and with art. You know, it was always my goal to use those job experiences to anchor myself towards what I thought I was meant to be doing. You know, so business school is a fantastic way for people to change careers because no one after business school asks you, well, why are you getting trying to get a job in an entertainment company? You come from healthcare. Business school is the all equalizer for someone trying to make a career pivot, which what it which really is what it allowed me to do. It's impressive. So, so I want to touch. Uh... One of the things I was reading actually uh, recently, a quote that the three most important things in your life, at least in terms of breakthroughs, is art breaks, um, failures, and as well, um, mostly some kind of elf or some kind of breakthrough. Um, so can you tell us about that? Because of course, from, from uh, Wharton to uh, one of the biggest banks and financial organizations in the world, and then getting out and going to healthcare and then and going to, to Harvard is really an impressive, but as well, very different perspective. And that was part of your discovery. But I would like to touch that precisely. How do you, let, how do you manage that? Because I think that's an interesting point that changed probably your life. Because if you would continue there, it probably would be going in a different direction. You know, it's interesting. I have one thing I learned from the pre Harvard experience, and I continue to use to, till today, is you have to work with big people. Like one of the things that became very clear to me when I was wor working at Goldman Sachs is I wasn't necessarily working for the most prominent boss. I wasn't working for a boss that had the goodwill of the organization, who wanted me to win, who wanted herself to win. And I knew I needed to get myself out of that heap of just working for, uh, for the middle, right? What healthcare allowed me to do was the ability to work for the top, work for somebody who's really prominent, right? Rick was, even now, but at the time, he was always an extremely visible and prominent person. And Columbia HCA was a visible and prominent company. And to go to the CEO suite at that age, I drew a lesson for myself that I wanted to keep for the rest of my life, is always try to work with visible people because they're there for a reason. They're successful for a reason. And most likely they've done something to manage up and down that keeps them at the top. So Rick was a very important lesson for me to say, surround yourself with incredibly accomplished people. Whenever I've gone against that, it's generally not worked out for me. Um, when I got to Harvard, you know, I kind of took that same lesson with me, which is, Whatever job I do next, I got to work for, work for or work with really prominent executives and um, artistic people coming out of Harvard. So it wasn't an easy thing, but when I came out of business school, my job was to work for an agency 
um, that represented Beyonce, that represented Will Smith, that represented Christina Aguilera, you know? It's an agency that, um, that was formed by a group of lawyers in LA who were very prominent and they had access to the clients I wanted to be around. It was not an easy job because, you know, when you're surrounded by people like that, you're always like the junior person in the room. I, here I had like a Harvard MBA, I worked for Rick Scott, but all of a sudden I'm back to, you know, like basically being an intern. But I kept in mind that the, the, the path towards really getting the best out of this business is to still work for big names. You know, I did not really want to work for a smaller company that had lesser clients. I wanted to work for a company that had big, gigantic, prominent clients and still be the junior person. It's probably the conservative side of me, but again, it's worked out in, in, with that philosophy. Um, you get to a point, you know, where I was at that agency for three years and uh, it was Irving Azoff, who was a big client of that agency that said, you know, why don't you kind of leave and go do this yourself? I'll, I'll, help, I'll bring some clients over to you. And I said, really? Wow, that, that'd be cool. I said, who would, you, who would you help me sign? He said, how about Christina Aguilera? I said, okay. How about the Eagles? I said, okay. That's not a bad idea. So I left and one, upon leaving, I got sued. It was the first and only litigation in my life because my partners at the time said, look, you can't just leave with Christina Aguilera. There's consequences to leaving with Christina Aguilera. Um, so we were in a lawsuit. Uh, that was not pleasant. We could obviously spend an entire session talking about litigation in the entertainment business. But post the litigation, um, I was able to really start on, on the back of that litigation, I was really able to start my agency, well, which I ran for about 10 years. Um, and I, I had a ball doing it. That was, really that was the entrance into entertainment. And creative industries, let's put it that way. Although I know more from the business side. So, so can you tell us about that, that experience with 10 years? Because 10 years is a very strong, and it was, of course, building a business in a very, very competitive, but it's like you mentioned, with lawsuits and, and I know that the entertainment industry in the US is the most competitive in the world to say less, but yeah. it's as well not as simple. And as well being a woman leading a company on the world that is probably more male, uh, but as well very strong uh, and very competitive. So a bit of that background, if you wanna to touch whatever you can touch public. So Vault Agency was my, my own agency. I had a series of very powerful strategic alliances. Again, because I always go back to, you need big alliances, you need sort of big anchor names to give you relevance and access. So I had a very powerful strategic alliance with the firm, which was the nation's uh, biggest management company at the time, you know, and I had a very powerful strategic alliance with a company called Brand Asset Group, which had 50 cent as a client. So I formed these two strategic alliances and they allowed me access to clients, there were revenue share opportunities. There were times where I just felt like I worked for the firm and there were times I felt like I worked for Brand Asset Group. So I um, used those two alliances to form a base of very strong entertainment clients in the specific area of consumer products licensing. See, you can't, as a person just coming into entertainment without a family member in entertainment, without, you know, um, any sort of background in entertainment, you can't just go in. At least for me, I felt it very hard. I didn't really, I never spent time in a movie set. I never really spent time in a, in a traditional agency. So I had to find an angle. My angle was, let me take these huge clients, right? Like 50 Cent, like Christina Aguilar, like Beyonce, and do consumer products licensing. That's an area that wasn't saturated at the time. So I quickly anchored myself and I pivoted myself to make sure that I was one of the more known people in town who did fashion deals, who did fragrance deals, who did deals between uh, these celebrities in Walmart with Target. And I really heavily leaned into retail deals to consistently stay relevant. Did I love doing it? 
yes and no. It's a, it, the, the great thing about it is there's a lot of good money in the business. There's a lot of uh, high visibility when you're representing someone like 50 Cent in the area of consumer products licensing. There's a lot of big deals to be done. Um, the downside of that business is that you're not necessarily doing something that's core to their business, right? You're not necessarily in the studio with them. You're not necessarily reading scripts for them. So you're still very much on a business that is their add on business. It's not their core business. And there's downsides to that, right? Um, but back to my original kind of working model, if you work with big celebrities, you will always be able to find other businesses and clients because they give you access. So I developed a very strong corporate business on, uh, just by being in the grid, right? I developed a business representing the music publishers. For instance, I represented Sony Music Publishing, I represented Universal Music Publishing. If you had anywhere in the country, if you found a t-shirt that said, all you, can, all you need is love or give peace a chance or let it be, it was most likely a licensing program that I initiated and ran, right? So you sign corporate clients, you sign celebrity clients, and then you get into some really fun things being in that business, like signing designers. I signed a designer named Paul Frank, who at the time had a massive Macy's business. Uh, and I was responsible for taking him into Walmart. So you kind of use anchor clients, anchor projects, and then you start to figure out ways in which you can extend those skills into other probably more profitable areas like corporate work, representing designers, representing, um, in fact, retailers in certain cases. So uh, it takes, you know, a business like that takes about 10 years to build, but you will get there if you stay focused. Impressive because you, you had the creative part, but you create an entire business and you touch, like you mentioned, the retail, the designer. So it was a lot of different things working together, which, which partly explains the success in the different areas that you have. But as yeah. well, you were doing that not as a creator, you were doing that as a business person, but as well as a sense of creator. So I want to touch that part. So how did you kept that balance? Because that, I have to be honest, in my case, it took me probably 10 years as well to separate my artistic part with my business part and create the balance as well. So I completely understand how I was challenging for you and as well how you build all of that at, in parallel. So I would like to touch that. So how did you keep these two parts of your personality and, uh, and as well uh, um, the way you are working together? The, those 10 years were <laughs> very interesting because I was essentially doing something that I had to do to stay peripherally involved in, in the entertainment business, to be surrounded by people that I admired and loved and continue to stay relevant in Los Angeles. But it was a 10 years where I had to be an Academy Award winning actress to do something I really wasn't meant to be doing. And that is very much the immigrant story is you have to kind of spend some years hiding in quiet desperation, right? is being in the room with Christina Aguilera, but not being able to say, hey, I'm a Bollywood singer, you know, or being in the room with Paul Frank, who's known for, you know, his artistic skill, his drawing, his crafting and saying, Paul, I don't draw at all. I, I don't know anything, you know, like you have to pretend to be, when you're on celebrities, I hate to say this, but there has to be a part of you that is willing to pretend to be somebody you're not, because it's not about, you it's about them right that's fine that is all fine and dandy but if you're someone like me who has enormous artistic skill who's been training and doing it for the bulk of her childhood right then you that's a that becomes a problem right it becomes a problem when the bulk of your childhood is spent going back and forth from india and learning classical indian music and learning classical italian music and not being able to tell a single person that you were a singer. You know? At some point, that problem becomes a true liability. And that's what happened for me. Towards the tail end, um, towards by 2008, I would say, you know, I, I'd been in the business for what, nine years. I really felt like I was just living a lie. You know, going down to Bentonville to see the Walmart folks, going to Minneapolis to see Target. And yet I could never, ever openly talk about 
the singing, the, all the stuff that I had done as a kid and continue to do in secret, you know? You, like, I, I am an example of you can't live that way, you know? Even if there's a lot of money to be made in, in hiding, it gets to a point where it's just not sustainable. There is no, there is no bigger, there's no better person to say, I wish I wasn't a singer. I wish I wasn't good at drawing because I would have loved to have continued that easy path where I was just representing clients, going to Bentonville, signing bigger and bigger clients, running an agency, and eventually I'll sell the agency to someone like CAA or IMG. There's no better person than me to say, I really wish that I wasn't a singer. But at some point, you are who you are, right? You can't hide. You just have to tell, you have to find some sort of a connection to what you're really good at. And um, that was a very difficult time in my life. You know, just the constant lying and hiding and, and really wishing that I didn't have this artistic skill and wishing I could just keep down a path of making money and raise my kids and just have a nice existence. Unfortunately, it, it just, the brain wasn't really working out with the reality. Uh, like what was going on in my brain had very little connection to what was going on in my life. That, that is actually from a personal uh, well-being and wellness. It's not, it's not an easy thing. And I completely understand how, especially being so successful in an area, but hiding the other part, it's, it's really a massive challenge for your personality. And it probably could create a lot of uh, almost schizophrenic approach towards your own perception of reality because you have, you have, you've been always hiding one part of yours. So how did you left that, that part uh, after 10 years, very successful working with the leading personalities in the planet? How did you break through to become who you are right now and make that balance? Well, you have to look for these... Um... I don't believe in cosmic energy. I, I, I think it's just cosmic energy is something you create for yourself, right? I think I was signaling to people very strongly that I was just bored, right? So when the firm dissolved, you know, that was my main strategic alliance. When the firm dissolved in 2008, I didn't aggressively pursue to go with the new entity, right? I was open to it, but I wasn't, I didn't chase it. I didn't chase my, the previous owners and say, hey, you guys are starting a new company. Let me come with you. I kind of just went home and <laughs> took naps, if you will. I was just taking naps. You know, I, I just didn't want to go and aggressively look for a new, um, a new platform. So it opened my time up a little bit. I mean, I still had clients, right? I still had clients and they were constantly asking me, well, where are you going to take your practice? Are you going to go to like, you know, CAA? Or are you going to go to UTA? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I'm still going to service you guys. But in that moment of silence, you tend to open up, you tend to shorten your lines. And what I mean by that is when I was running my business with, these big strategic alliances and being busy 24 seven, my lines were very long, right? I had, it, it would take a, for, forever to get a meeting with me, right? It would take forever to, for me to call someone back. I just didn't have any time. But then when you go home and you decide I'm not gonna go to CAA or wherever, you know, you, you don't pursue the next thing, all of a sudden you're calling people back faster. You're, you know, you're responding to emails faster because you have that time. And I think in the process of just being available a little bit, 20% more available, I was practicing singing more. I was playing piano more. I was doodling more. I was just doing things that like I never had the time to do. And then, you know, you have these crazy things kind of open up. One crazy thing that opened up for me was Slumdog Millionaire was probably one of the first movies, you know, in a long time that gave Indian people some visibility. That was a distinct departure from the America that I had experienced in the 80s, which didn't like Indian people so much, to where 
hey, this is India and this is kind of cool. Like a guy like Danny Boyle directed this movie and it shows the hard parts of India and people didn't make fun of me for that, right? So Slumdog comes and then I just watched the movie and I, when I watched the movie, I was like, this thing's gonna get an Oscar. Good Lord, <laughs> wow, this is so good. You know, t some time goes by and, um, you know, at that time I'd, I had left, I had created that 20% uh, give in my schedule. And it turns out that A.R. Rahman was in town, you know, because he had been nominated for the Oscar. He, there, there was a good chance he'd be performing himself at the Oscars. They were auditioning females, specific, specifically Bollywood singing females who could potentially sing with him at the Oscars. Um, I thought, hey, maybe I just stand in line. <laughs> like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, there'll be a thousand women on this in this line, but let me just stand in line. No one knows, you know, in this community, no one knows I'm an executive. No one knows I'm a um, Harvard MBA. So let me just stand in line and be a singer for God's sakes. So did that. They got my tape and uh, AR's manager at the time was like, and I'm, I'm just imagining what he might have thought when he heard my tape. He probably thought, this, is, this seems like a Bollywood singer to me. <laughs> so, so then I was asked to go um, basically to a rehearsal. And during the rehearsal, all of a sudden I'm here with A.R. Rahman, a person I'd followed as, you know, pretty much into my, from my childhood as the most famous Indian composer of all time. And, there he is standing in the flesh and I'm here like having, you know, been in the studio for almost 10 years. And I, I didn't know, I, I didn't even know what that moment meant. Um, but that moment was very significant, needless to say, you know, that was, that was a moment where I had probably the biggest pivot in my life. Something that I'm still regret that I'm still trying to deal with today, I think. So if anything, it's, it's, it's the theme of that is you have to find those moments. And, and if it's a moment, it's got to be a big enough moment. You can't, you can't think of, mo see the problem with identifying a moment in your life is that you can identify something that is kind of small and think it's a big moment, right? On the one hand, and then on the other hand, if it's a really big moment and you don't pay attention to it, then that moment just passes you by. So it's like, you have to be pretty clever and figuring out if it is the moment. It's really wonderful because you went back to basis and you had to almost delete a fantastic career that was on the top of the world to start from the basis, which ironically, that's what you were doing for the biggest stars in the planet. Um, I, I think it's really beautiful at the same time. Uh, and as well, you had to have a sense of humility to go back and to put yourself competing with so much people uh, with an area that uh, although you were prepared all your life, it was not the career that you choose, at least the, the yeah. first decade. It's really special. You so know, I, I would it, like to yeah, go ahead. It's interesting you bring up the humility point because I had, you know, I am um, very much a person who has seen the extreme highs and lows, right? So when I worked for Rick Scott, I was very powerful. I was very young. And you get a, this sense of rented power. It's not your own power, but you're renting it from somebody. So you get this false sense that you're like somebody on the top and you realize later on in life it didn't mean shit right so sorry to, sorry to use uh curse words here but it didn't mean anything when i was representing 50 cent and i was being flown out to paris to meet cody you're like oh my god i'm the agent you know like whatever then when you get to a moment where you're sitting as like a, a person uh, just a nobody in front of ar Rahman as just a singer then your background doesn't matter and it is those, it is that humility that gets you through that moment. And the reason I have always been able to tap into humility is because um, I was forced to be very humble as a, as a kid. You know, I wasn't necessarily the most sought after friend in middle school or high school. I was oftentimes the person who uh, no one wanted to talk to. So I got used to being the, uh, no, I, I got used to being the person who was not the most liked person. You know, that, that was a place that I was familiar with. 
So when I went back to singing, feeling, feeling like somebody who was nothing was in a, in a weird distorted way, was a comfortable place for me. <laughs> you know, it was a place where I actually like, was like, hey, I'm back home. You know, so it, it did allow me to get, be, it, it did allow me to fit in um, into that moment. I think it's a sense of authenticity because first of all, it's what you love and you love uh, now, but as, as well as coming back, back to basis and a lot of different things. There's really a special moment and I think it's really, like you said, some kind of a cosmic moment that happens in life. So I think that of course opened a lot of different doors for you. They were actually the doors that were open for the artists you represented, but now on your own. So I would like to touch that because I think uh, being an artist uh, or a creative, it's, it's a very blessing um, equipment. But at the same time, it's, it's something very difficult because like you said, it implies a sense of ego, a sense of independence, a sense of financial viability on that. And most of the artists cannot manage all these different things together. So I would like to touch that. Um, so that moment, of course, you were in the Oscars and you, it was the, actually the song that won the Oscars that year. Um, and of course, it's still, uh, 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 well, uh, like you mentioned, it's a, I would say that is a, a, an iconic moment because that film is an iconic in a lot of levels, besides being done by a, a UK filmmaker that is touching Bollywood, the uh, iconic moments and as well with all the, the music and everything else. But how did that part open different directions in your career? Because I think it's really amazing what happened there. Well, getting on the Oscars itself was very challenging because I had some, I had some enemies, you know, like I did the Jay Leno show with AR and um, the, there was another person who was singing a different part of the film. And her father was a very powerful agent at the time. Her father ran a quite powerful campaign to discredit my skill and, and my, my, you know, my eventually getting to the Oscars. Basically, her father said, look, put my daughter in the whole thing. Let's get rid of Enrita, right? Let's just delete her. Like she did date Jay Leno, that's great, you know, but let her just go away because my daughter is better looking. She's more talented. She's younger. She's the natural person. And, um, you know, that is, again, it's very hard. Those moments are very hard. You just have to eat it. You know, there's, there, there really is nothing you can do when somebody like that is, is gunning for you, you know? Um, so they asked me to, what they asked me to do is, th this person didn't know Hindi very well. So they asked me to train her to replace me for the Oscars. So I, you know, I, I said, okay, fine. And um, I, I literally, I went in, I trained her, I tried to get her Hindi diction up. And um, she, she and I both went to sit with AR. She did all my parts, her parts, mainly my parts, and she sang it in Hindi. And then we were done with that part of the Oscars audition. And then I get a call from AR's manager saying, you're in the Oscars, you know, so oh. <laughs> I, it's like talking about dodging a bullet, you know, it's just, uh, the best thing I did, the best thing I did at that moment is just, I just went along with it. You know, if she wanted me to train her to replace me, that was, I, I looked at it like that's in the cards for me, you know, like, like at the end of the day, I didn't, I didn't, those are those things where you just, ha you have to teach yourself some lessons, right? At that moment, when I was being ousted from the Oscars, if you will, I had to, I had to tell myself, hey, Amrita, you didn't go to Juilliard. You didn't, you chose not to lead a purely creative life. You decided to go to Wharton and make money and to be this executive. Had you had chosen to go to Juilliard and how do you, had you had chosen to be, you know, just a pure singer, maybe you wouldn't have, um, been put in this humiliating position, you know? So those are those times where you just have to have the conversation with yourself, like, dude, you had this coming, <laughs> you know? Like, what do you think was gonna happen? And it's the, it's the conversations with the self that are so unbelievably painful, 
right? Because it's a choice I made not to be a creative. And then when I did get the call to sing in the Oscars, I thought, okay, well, this is an anomaly. This is not going to happen again because you didn't really deserve to be here because you didn't put in the time, you know, over the last 10 years. So don't look, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Just take it, be grateful, get up there, right? And it's a bonus. It's something that was just like, it's, it's a complete bonus. That's how I viewed it, you know? Um, so got up there and sang the song and pretty soon my phone could not stop ringing. I mean, when I tell you like the inbound calls that happen when you are the only Indian singer in town who can sing Bollywood music and everybody's looking for a Bollywood singer, that's when things really, that's when the action starts. And the next two years were just action, action, action. And I was going to milk every single moment of that action. You better believe it. The hardest part of milking every single moment of the action was then your clients start calling and saying, you lied to me. Why did you not say this? And who the hell are you? You get, you know, you get those very difficult conversations. You get clients like, you, I need you back in, I need you back at your desk right now. You know, I need you, I need you going to Walmart. I, and then you say, look, I'm still going to do the Walmart thing, but I'm not going to, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm giving, I'm, I'm finding you somebody else. I'm, I'm quitting. You know, that, that's, those, those are those moments where you're just like, what am I doing? Am I doing something that I'm going to regret? Am I going to do something that ends in tears or am I, am I doing this? You know, look, at the end of the day, I still don't know if I made the right choice. I don't. Of course it is. No, I mean, think it, it, you, you still have to go back and have those honest conversations with yourself. You still have to go and say, you are who you are, right? I don't know if I made the right choice telling my clients to go fuck off and heading to the studio instead. But, you know, like I said, with, when you have my level of artistic skill, it is, it is, um, it is a shame when you don't use it. It's very special as well, because the point is that it's really listen to you. First, I would have reacted in a much more aggressive way. And I would put my CEO hat with my creative hat to working together. But you separate the personality, which even the way you're speaking now, which is very special, but it shows as well how you take a purity of your artistic knowledge and, and as well, um, uh, well, all the virtues that you have in, in your artistic capacities which is very, very intense because I think probably I, I try to create an hybridization between that. I'm talking on my own, but listen to you, I think is really impressive because I think, of course, it, it, you, you partly was because you're singing that they won the Oscar. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> so. What you learn about the entertainment business is by the time you're asked to perform a song or a number in the Oscars, right, you're likely going to win the Oscar. They're, they're asking you to perform yeah, because they're going to give you the Oscar. So people who are invited as performers are just there to be part of the marketing machine. It, it had nothing to do with me. I was literally part of the promotional aspect of making sure that once the Oscars were granted to Slumdog Millionaire, that the film would just continue to sell tickets and have an aftermarket sale in the video on demand business, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but don't, don't underestimate. You were chosen by your merit, not because of your career, not because of anything else. And I think that's really an impressive thing as well. But I, but I love your humility. Your... I was chosen because of my focus, right? The, the reason you get chosen on something so niche, like being um, a Bollywood singer, is that you are you become a Bollywood singer in located in Los Angeles, which just doesn't happen, right? It's it's such a niche thing. Um, that who else are you going to, I mean, there were, there are a lot of Bollywood singers, like they would have easily flown somebody out of New York, out of Mumbai. That's, that's not hard at all. But the reason I think I had that, that specific opportunity is because there is still a level of focus that is hard to maintain. Right. Cause they think about it from a singer standpoint, a singer like me, I, I, I trained in Italian, I trained in classical opera, I trained in uh, Hindustani and Bengali music. I trained in a lot of, at a very high level, by the way, 
you know, with multiple teachers. I trained in piano for close to 15 years. So I had a level of versatility in music that allowed me to say, hey, why don't I do R&B? Why don't I do opera? But I was pretty sure that my voice for Bollywood, for like a classically oriented Bollywood type of song would be really good. And it's maintaining that level of focus that helps you in your life, right? Even now when I'm asked to sing, I don't generally do anything that doesn't have an Indian bent to it. Because I know that I'm not gonna be distinctive. I can do r and I can do any country music, I can do all those genres, but where you really get like, oh, that's different, that's so cool, that's so different, is where I'm leaning into the Bollywood. That's the, that's the kind of thing that allows me to get on, on the Oscars, because you present yourself as a very specialized person. It's really very magic, and I think it's a sense of craftsmanship that is unique, pureness, and craftsmanship in terms of your art and focus, which is really amazing. And as well, a sense of understanding really how focused you are in creating a top quality, uh, in this case, with your voice, with your music. So I, I want to touch this, and I, I think we are passing uh, some time, but I really am excited. I think we have a bit more of time. I have a couple more questions. So I will just, uh, from this experience, of course, you, you reversed engineer your career. Yes. And, uh, and you open a lot of different spectra, even, of course, all the people, because you were working with the biggest people on the planet, which is kind of, there was no bigger than that, <laughs> all the equivalents. And now you are building your music career and uh, you start other things. So can you tell us about that, yeah. that trajectory? Well, post Oscars, then the hustling really began. <laughs> you know, then I was like, okay, now I got to roll up my sleeves. So how do you do this? You know, and that was a series of like, strategy meetings with myself, strategy meetings with my husband, and we really had to, to you know, as, as almost like because I supported my husband, really craft out what my, my own personal brand needed to be. So the first thing I did was I got myself on a lot of big records, right? Weezer, got myself on the Justin Timberlake record, got myself on Pitbull records, developed a beautiful working relationship with Timbaland, beautiful working relationship with AR, just a lot of like exposure in, in, in the area of music. Jeremy Soule, who is the composer of Skyrim, really like fantastic partnerships. I formed a brand called Bali Doll, which was such a great pivot for me, honestly, because Bali Doll was just a series of artistic illustrations that I drew myself and that had an album behind it. So I composed an album, you know, I composed like 26 songs and I did 26 illustrations. I worked with Timbaland and Timbaland presented those 26 illustrations with me to at Art Basel, at Miami Art Basel. And we did a presentation of those illustrations, which really gave me credibility as a, as a visual artist, right? 26 paintings. I then called all my previous contacts from my licensing days, right? Representing Paul Frank and representing 50 Cent. And I said, look, I got these illustrations. Let's license these illustrations. Let's bring them into Macy's. Let's bring them into Nordstrom's. So Bali Doll, as a brand, was pretty quickly, within, I would say, 18 months, in Macy's, in Dillard's, in Nordstrom's. I had like 30 license deals going, right? And I ended up doing a collaboration with MAC Cosmetics. And here I was. Nobody even knew at, by, by 2013, right? It took me about two years to construct that whole brand you know, uh, portfolio, if you will. Nobody knew that I had a previous job as a licensing agent. They knew me as Amrita Sen Bali doll, right? They knew me as Amrita Sen, collaborator with Mac Cosmetics, artist, designer, somebody who sang in the Oscars. And here I was, completely a different person. Then Bali doll started having extension problems and that a lot of retailers didn't want Bali, something called Bali doll. So I had to pivot again and redo a lot of artwork or redo a lot of rebranding under my own name, Amrita Sen Designs. So I started Amrita Sen Designs, I think in 2015, and now I have both brands that are kind of equally distributed across retail, with Amrita Sen Designs actually being much higher volume than Bali Doll, ironically. Even though I use Bali Doll to, to 
um, to pivot away from my business career, it was essential that I start calling my art under my own name, right? Because people at, the, at some point people were like, well, who's Bali Doll? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, it's Amrita Sen Designs. Here we go. Um, so that that is kind of how the design thing really really started sh shaping up, formulating. I run Amrita Sen Designs. I love it. I'm in Wayfair. I love Bali Doll. You can see all the stuff. I mean, I'm in Walmart. I'm in all sorts of places, Bed Bath and Beyond. I've done programs for pretty much every big retailer. Again, it's very Indian art. It is. I don't pretend to be. A Native American artist. I don't pretend to be somebody who's into modern design. If you want something Indian that's influenced by Jaipur, influenced by Bollywood, that's where you go. You you come to me. You know, it's just that same focus that I've stood by all my life. Is if you want something that's kind of Indian, I'm your best bet. You know, and I'm gonna stick by that for now. No, oh, and well, that is fantastic. So I want to touch one thing that I really love. I found actually it was difficult. I want to buy the book myself, but I couldn't have it. It's mm -hmm. a cosmic and eternal love, an everlasting love story and coloring book. It's yeah. really beautiful. I found the, uh, I, I was trying to find it. It's not available. At least I didn't find it in Amazon UK. Yeah. But uh, can you tell us about that book? Because the book is a, a concentration of all of that. Cosmic and Eternal Love was my first uh, attempt at saying, okay, I love Bali Doll. I want to continue doing Bali Doll, but how about some, a few more other brands? How about if I could do this, if I could keep coming up with these illustrated stories with music, which is like my thing now, you know, why don't I try to make more stories? Why don't I try to do another book called, so I, you know, I, I did a series of books, right? I did a series of books with their own album, with their own illustrations. I have like four of them. Cosmic and Eternal Love happened to be something that Barnes and Noble really got behind and licensed it. And I got a deal with Chronicle Books and Gallison. So it, it just had a, it, it had a really good business platform for me to do a lot of different things with it. So um, after Cosmic and Eternal Love, actually, I got really busy. <laughs> I got really busy because I took Cosmic and Eternal Love to partner uh, with a celebrity in India, right? And um, the celebrity in India said, well, I like the book, but why don't you do more stories that match Indian talent with all of your stuff? And that was, uh, that became another, yet another opportunity I just couldn't say no to, is working with truly big Indian celebrities to make these stories come to life in America, really. No, it's wonderful, actually. Uh, I managed to find it. Uh, we'll, I will get it and probably we'll find about it. The book is really beautiful book and it's really special. So um, I, I'm conscious about your time, so I want to respect that. So two, two or three last questions and it will be fast. So one of them, and you touched right now on this. So of course you are right now, well, after this uh, uh, jump from a fantastic, successful career um, in, the, in more the business side of the entertainment industry to build your own path as a creator. And as well, you shift from music uh, to design to as well as an artist and creative. And of course, being an art vessel, that is the biggest art event in the world. It's quite impressive. And of course, working with Timbaland and uh, Justin Timberlake, two of the biggest artists and producers in the world. So I would like to just hear, how do you stand right now in this path of your career? And what would be the things that you want to see right now going forward to your personal career? Well, you know, when you, when you go, start really leaning into India, Right, because I, I am in, I am Indian. I I have um, all this background. When you really start leaning in in a big way, right, which which is what I'm trying to do, then all of a sudden you're in a big market. You know, you're no longer just an artist that is trying to do Indian art. You basically become part of the overall ecosystem of of Indian content. And then when you get into Indian content, you realize, okay, there is something else going on here. There's streamers that are competing with each other, Amazon, Netflix, Hotstar, Sony Live, Voot, they're all competing with each other to kind of do a much bigger scale of what you're already doing. They're creating stories. They're looking to commercialize Indian content. They're looking to bring it across the world. So, you know, then you're like either join them or e either compete with them or join them. They're, 
what's going on in India now is too big to compete with. You have to, if you want to be an Indian artist, you have to work with the larger uh, ecosystem of what's going on there. And what's going on there is truly remarkable. And I'm a small part of it, but it's a gigantic market. So what's going on in India is filmmakers, actors, creators, writers, they're all seeking to collaborate with the West to change not only the distribution outlets that are available to them, but to change the fundamental material, to change the type of stories, like what I did with Cosmic and Eternal Love for Barnes and Noble. They're looking to change the types of stories that are being consumed all around the world, right? As an example, I'm doing a movie with, I'm producing a movie with Joe Roth and Jeff Kirschenbaum that is about John Cena traveling to India to find the next big Indian WWE star. That's a piece of content that would not have happened five years ago. And also that's a piece of content that really needs me to kind of do the deal making and do the creative deal making as well. It just, it's, it's a piece, it's a type of product where I can add a lot of value because I've packaged Tiger Shroff, I'm integral to how it's sold, I'm integral to how the whole thing is shaping up of a, as a story with both cultures. But that's gonna be a type of content, which I believe there's gonna be a lot of, like there's gonna be a lot of that stuff and it's gonna be good. And it's gonna be consumed in Latin America, it's gonna be consumed in Eastern Europe. India is not going away, right? Indian stories, like what I've been trying to do all my life, Indian art, Indian stories, Indian culture is something that actually, if we just make it less uh, inaccessible, could be pop culture. So that's kind of my thing. You know, my thing is to be part of the pop culture's pop culturation of Indian art and music. And I have the tremendous backing of big people now, my clients, my producing partners, big talent to do that. And it's a much, it's honestly, it feels much more home than I was either at Goldman Sachs or doing it on my own. When you work with big people, they provide you the support system you need to do very difficult things, which this is gonna be a difficult journey, but I'm not, I'm not alone doing it. So I do feel very positive about the future because I feel like for the first time, I'm not trying to just run a flag up the hill where I'm the only person waving the flag. Oh, that's wonderful. And um, so one of my last uh, questions, and uh, of course, there's a lot of things. I think I will probably want to have a second round with you. But I think one of the things I want to touch is uh, partly because of the, the different backgrounds in your career, you touch production, um, agent uh, work, a financial part, business developing, um, um, as well, all the areas of uh, merchandising and creating rights around products and, and different things, which is right now, in the end of the day, is all the world economy. <laughs> Although you're putting this in India, and of course the Indian culture in the end of the day, most of the big myths from Star Wars come actually from stories of India, which has a mythological, very rich uh, scenario that comes to some of the narratives in the world. So one of the questions I have is, so with technology, right now especially we have so much things around technology um how do you see for instance the creative industries in particular and in relation to new things like the nfts non-fungible tokens and um and as well all this creativity that is coming around the mix because a non-fungible to to token for instance is precisely an artist putting like a certificate of authenticity around this piece of art or uh, around this piece of music but put it in a digital format that can sell worldwide through platforms, which is kind of, in your case, you are touching all these different things to boo. Even for instance, for your book, you had no, no, Barn and Novels, but you have to go through Amazon. But an artist right now, like you can actually sell any place in the world if it has the, the digital skills. I want to touch, I know that you are touching some of these areas, but I would like to see how do you see this, especially with your fantastic uh, acumen and as well experience, because your experience is unique in all areas. It's, it's a really good question because fundamentally whatever any artist right and if you're an artist who's a who's a screenwriter right i like if you think about the types of artists that i work with today in my all fire all cylinders job right my job very much today is my brain has to be working on overdrive on all sorts of creative 
endeavors. Primarily, I'm working with musicians. I'm working with digital artists. I'm working with e-commerce artists. And I, I say e-commerce artists because it's a highly creative business format, e-commerce, constantly changing, and screenwriters. Fundamentally, it's about controlling your IP. The minute you let go of your IP and just start um, treating it like it's completely, you know, a free for all garbage can is when you run into trouble, right? So this concept of like over posting everything, doing highly, highly high res versions of your digital art on Instagram so people could just take a screenshot of it and print it. I don't think that's the best way. I think there are platforms that are promotional that are teaser platforms. And I think there's platforms that are truly meant for consumption, right? So a YouTube uh, link is a great promotional vehicle for where you really need to consume a mini series, which is Netflix or Amazon. You know, you, you don't wanna just give away everything like you're vomiting out content. It won't protect anybody, it won't help anybody. And there's no way to actually sustain a living for an artist if you start doing that. So it's just a kind of creating tears for your, not only for your own art, but tears for yourself. Tears for yourself was where am I gonna be exploitative, right? Where am I going to be someone that is open and it's an open market for my gift? And where am I gonna be relatively guarded about my gift? And you gotta make those, you gotta just be very intelligent and make those decisions. But there's a distributional channel for all tiers of yourself, right? Uh, even, even in a screenplay, even in a screen, like you could do a short and most likely if you wanna get paid for that, like one minute short, you're probably not gonna get paid for it. It's probably gonna be a good loss leader, but have the discipline to then go write a full screenplay. You know, it's, every artist has to do that. I mean, and it's not like even of our own time, even Mozart had to do that. He had to go to the king and say, okay, I'm going to do this beautiful uh, sonata for you. I'm going to play it for you. You could just pay me a dollar. But then, king, if I keep coming here day in and day out and I play you multiple sonatas, you better commission my, you know, opera. So the lost leader model is not just what is today with NFTs or Instagram. It's been there all the, throughout history. Well, I love that. I think you need to write a book about it <laughs> because this is, I think this is what is missing in the creative industries. And I think uh, that's why I think probably I would like to do definitely a second page on this because I think the point right now is like you said, is that uh, the fact that we have so much tools that are giving away so much content and not empowering the artists worldwide. And most of the artists are living in the verge of poverty and as well, they cannot make money. Even a lot of very famous artists are struggling, especially with COVID. So I think as the last uh, few, few things that I would like to touch on, I think picking on what you just said, I think uh, what would be the advice that you give for artists or creators looking at us today? Because you just mentioned a very important thing. You mentioned e-commerce, which is a creative thing and is a very demanding one because for instance, your design brands that you have and uh, that you've been building, it's really a massive task to build an, a, a business on that. And I, you can touch about that because I would like to hear, but how do you, what would be the, the advice from your experience building that? And I think you can touch about special the design business that you create, which is very powerful. Well, look, I'm not assuming that every artist is gonna have the, the luxury of going to business school like I did, okay? So when you don't have the luxury of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on formal education, don't get discouraged go back to a philosophy, right? Because ultimately what you learn from school are, are truly um, philosophical decisions. And I'd say if you're just a, if you're a starving artist or you consider yourself one, here's the deal. It's, there's lost leader business. There's, lo there's yourself as a artist that will always have a lost leader component to what you do. You will always have to do free work. You will always have to do spec work screenwriter, musician, vocalist, composer, dancer, designer, you are not gonna get away from doing business that is free, speculative and loss leader. Then there's exploitation, truly like what I would call the harvest. You're never gonna be in a situation where you're just harvesting and getting every ounce of wheat 
for the seed that is your creativity. That's also unrealistic. You got to find that balance, right? You have to have the mental judgment to know when you're going to harvest, if you will harvest it and skin every single piece of skin off that carcass, or are you going to give it away? You know, and you have to constantly walk around with that portfolio and you will make money doing it. it it's, it's just, you keep working at it. You keep working at it. I'm just, I'm confident. You know, I heard an interview with Lady Gaga and she says, the one thing I've learned in my life is if you keep working hard, you will, it will happen. You know, it's just, it's hard to put in the physical and mental discipline to just keep working at something 16 hours a day, but it's going to happen. You know, the minute you start taking time off is probably when the whole thing starts crumbling down. So don't take that time off. Just keep at it, you know, but as an artist, rely on that fundamental principle is there's that spectrum between loss leader and harvest. And you're always going to be living in that somewhere within that spectrum. That's e-commerce for you. E-commerce is philosophically, that's what it is, right? And, and once you figure out what's going to be your loss leader, and what's going to be the areas where you can charge a premium, then you just build up the, you know, it's easier said than done, but you build up the en infrastructure to take advantage of that. And that's kind of what, you know, Emery Descend Designs is, is, um, is built to do. You know, I have certain things where I charge a lot of money. I have certain things where it's like, I'm losing money. <laughs> you know, it's okay. No, I, I love your working ethics, uh, which is amazing, but as well, your sense of, uh, um, professionalism and perfectionism, which is really Im impressive because uh, I think uh, when you want to be successful, there's the resilience that you mentioned, there's the persistence, but that is well the sense of not giving up of quality and the quality is about perfectionism, is about being obsessed with details. So really, I, I just want to give you a fantastic compliment on that because it's really impressive. So uh, I, I'm cautious about your time. I think we passed already one hour now. So um i think let, let's uh, uh if you have a couple more minutes but i think well where can people find you first of all because i think it's really important because your name is 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 competing with two other names and i think I we'll try to make sure that your digital presence uh at least is aligned because it's difficult sometimes to find all the amazing things you did so can you highlight the of course we want to put all these links but from your side it's great to hear from you well, absolutely. You can, so you can obviously go to my website, but you know, if you look at Wayfair and you type in my name, there's almost 2000 products. If you go to Walmart, you type in my name, there's 2000 products. If you go to Pier One, which is, I love the Pier One site, you know, I, um, hopefully I'm probably one of a handful of Indian designers on Pier One, you know, so I'm out there, you know, I, do I love the fact that someone um, else has, more of a digital presence than me? No, but it is what it is. I'm used to that. <laughs> so it's okay. Um, I think pretty soon by this time next year, I'll have a pretty big IMDb, IMDb profile. I will have, um, you know, a good music profile because I have a few more collaborations coming up. You know, just don't give up. Just keep trying. Somebody will find you. Oh, no, wonderful. <laughs> no, no, I think it's wonderful to find, but I think it's really because you have so much wonderful things that putting all together, it's really precious. So I want to thank you because, of course, I have much more questions, but I want to let you rest from this marathon. And def definitely, I would like to have one more about touching uh, the creativity and the process of creativity, because I think it's really particularly interesting. And it's an area that is not so discussed, because like you mentioned, a lot of people think about the creativity in one side and separate the other two parts and they let the middleman do all the work and then they get lost. And I think that's, uh, you, you show that you can actually be uh, bridging all this, this, these areas fantastically. So first of all, congratulations. One thing, one thing I would love to talk about in our next call is how uh, in the creative process and expanding your creativity, the role of vengeance. The role of vengeance, I think, is very important in a creative process. And we should oh. spend some time talking about that. Well, I love that. That is a script for a film as well. <laughs> that I, I love that. So let, let's let's start the next one. Is the role of vengeance and creative, role of vengeance <laughs> creative process. process. Remember, I said that. 
No, no, no. I, it's it's written and I take notes in this record. <laughs> I, I will want definitely to get one one about that. It's really impressive, and I I understand where you're coming from because really being an artist is a process of a lot of battles because you are competing, you are doing a lot of things, and it's very painful at the same time. And people forget very that. Painful. Yeah. Very painful. Yeah. But I but as well wonderful. Like, what else are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> No, well, I, I love that that wit of yours and that uh, energy as well. So thank you so much, Amrita. I, I, I have, so we'll, we'll have the take two, definitely. We'll talk about that and all the things, but I want to, to go start with that. So okay. thank you so much. Um, we'll put all the links to all your profiles. I think a lot of people will find the, uh, from your website, amritasan.com. Uh, that's Bali right. Bali yeah. com has a clips of my live show. And, you know, there's, there's if you look, and you get past the energy analyst, there's a lot of stuff on me. No, no, that's that we put actually, we, I think we found around 50 links of yours. Okay. So we'll be, we'll be together here. But I think even for us, it was difficult sometimes to bridge all the diversity of things you're doing. That's why I want to touch that uh, in this uh, final touch. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Amrit. It's been an honor and I'm really excited. And, uh, you. Thank you. And, and the round two, the process of vengeance in the creative, yes. the creative art I'm in. Mean. <laughs>